Good morning. Oh, there we go. Now you can hear me. Good morning. Welcome to church. Um, you guys can stand and worship with us. Let's let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for um, bringing us all here this morning, Lord. We thank you for your presence among us, Lord. We thank you for your love and all that you do for us. Um, may you be honored and glorified in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
up, Lord Jesus. Um, and that you speak through um, the message today, Lord. Um, open our hearts to hear what you have to say today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, I guess it's my turn. I wasn't sure how many songs we were doing today, so. Uh, good morning, Pine Valley Community morning. Church. Uh, we're back from Minnesota. It's nice to, to see all the familiar faces again. We were, uh, we were chased out of Minnesota by mosquitoes and tornadoes, and so it's nice that we, we, we all made it back fairly safe and sound, only minor injuries, but uh, we're good and we're back, and it's nice to see all the familiar faces. So, uh, first order of business, connection cards. These are in your bulletin. Feel free to take the time to see the QR code or fill it out. Drop it in the offering plate at the end of service. Um, and uh, it's a great way to communicate with the elder board, anybody, anything you want us to know, let us know. And there's actually quite a few announcements in here, so I, I picked out a few. Uh, number one, uh, we've got graduating seniors, and we want to congratulate and celebrate with them. Andrew, Cameron, and Ellie. Way to go. Congratulations. You'll be happy to know that the easiest days of your life are over. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, I, I had to just a little bit. Uh, second, got coming up, or uh, we've got barf nights. I know you've all heard, or I hope all of you heard what from Jeff what barf stands for. Bring a real friend, be a real friend, something like that. Um, but they're starting up here, and they've been here. Uh, they're July 8th through the 11th, so coming up pretty quick. Um, we got information on sports camp. I'll let you look and read that one yourself. Uh, women's retreat coming up. So take a look if you're interested in the women's retreat. That's in there. Um, inter intergenerational mission venture is uh, about to take off. So you can follow along the, the, uh, the uh, website or the blog site is in the bulletin so you can check in. Uh, Jeff puts a lot of time at the end of the night when everybody else is trying to sleep. Jeff gets on there and gives a write-up of the day of what they've done. And it's, it's really interesting, pictures and everything. So follow along there. Um, here's a fun one. Uh, PVCC GT, Pine Valley Community Church Got Talent. Uh, we're you know, doing, taking a play of the AGT thing. Uh, the next Food Truck Friday on July 12th. If you have a talent and you feel like making a fool of yourself and having a good time, we're doing a Got Talent show. So. Uh, contact Michaela if you want to participate. Uh, they're they're going to do burgers and stuff along with the regular food truck Friday stuff. It's going to be a blast. And you got to know you're loved here. So make it a fool of yourself faster is a good thing. So, oh, that's one thing I didn't even mention. If y'all didn't notice, the youngs are here. So, welcome. And so we, uh, uh, juggling or something for the God Talent Show would be great. Um, anyway, um, I think even though there is a bunch in here, I will leave the rest of it for you guys to read. Please open that and check it out. And other than that, say hi to somebody. Kids can go off towards the classrooms down the hall. Um, and uh, let's say hi to somebody. Thanks. You guys have enough time to meet and greet each other? No? All right, we'll give you 10 more seconds. Go. Welcome, welcome to Pine Valley Community Church. How is everybody today? Yeah, very cool. It's a good day. It's a really, really good day. If you heard that the new pastor has arrived and you thought he was going to be preaching today, maybe we can convince him. No, no, all right. So you're stuck with me for one more week. One more week for a while, I believe. But, uh, but yes. Pastor Keith, we are so happy that you are here, and Dolores and the kids. Um, it's been, I'm sure, a whirlwind of a week for you guys getting into town and stuff like that, but uh, we are so grateful. Their stuff isn't even here yet, so their stuff is supposed to arrive tomorrow, I believe. So the house has been mostly empty, but we did have some furniture in there for them. They got their cars. Those have arrived, so it's good, man. Really, really good. Exciting stuff. Our 
Intergenerational Mission Venture team does leave tomorrow for Colorado City, Arizona. We talked a little bit about that trip a couple weeks back. We are very excited to go and support our missionaries, Brody and Liz Olson, and just the incredible ministry that they are doing there. Um, like Greg mentioned in the bulletin, there's a blog address there. You guys could check up on the things that we're doing. Um, it's a really, really cool trip. Great opportunity. If you're an early bird and you want to see us off tomorrow morning, come here at 6.30, and we'll pray, and we'll head out. So some of you were laughing. I thought that was a joke. Um, we really would love for you to come. Uh, if you would turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to show you, while you guys are looking that up, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. We had talked about a basketball camp that we helped out with, a uh, church called Kaleo Church in El Cajon. So I've just got a few images to scroll through so that you can look at them and say, man, next year I'm helping with that because that looks like a lot of fun. Uh, we had a group of I don't know, 10 to 15 volunteers from Pine Valley Community Church or friends of people from Pine Valley Community Church all throughout the week. I heard there were 280 campers at this basketball camp. So that's huge. Really, really fun opportunity. Lots of kids just all over the place, uh, separated by age. They do a bunch of different basketball drills. They hear a gospel message every day. Such a, such a neat thing. So glad that we were able to be a part of it. So there's Andrew and Marcus at the beginning of camp just kind of like, Whoa, this is crazy. Uh, there's some more people just kind of getting ready for the camp. So it's at a middle school in El Cajon. Um, just a totally diverse range of kids. Some really, really good basketball players and some kids that look like they've never held a basketball before. So it's always fun in those situations just to kind of gauge the kids, get to know them, stuff like that. But all in all, they had a lot of fun. I think the last day they got to have a little water fight and got to get the coaches wet and all that good stuff, which is super fun. Uh, our church headed up kind of a younger kids play area, which was more like some game drills and stuff like that. If you've done uh, Team 45 here at our sports camp, we did a lot of those kind of games and drills, tails and different things like that. It was actually one of the favorites. I think it was probably one of the favorite areas for the kids because my wife headed it up one of the days um, and because it was in the shade. So like a big other section of that was not in the shade. So there were some, there were some toasty days, but it was really, really fun. If you look online, Paleo Church has a, like a five minute video of um, just some different clips from the basketball camp. Really, really cool opportunity. So if you're looking for more information in about a year as to how you guys can help, it was really, really, really fun. So let's get to our sermon today. Embrace what? Adventure. adventure. Any adventurous people in the house? Don't be afraid. There's like four, five, six, seven adventurous people in a room of however many we've got. Romans chapter 12. We'll be jumping around with some different scriptures. There, You should have some notes. Um, if you don't have any notes, I think there's probably a stack of them back there, but you should have some in your bulletin. We'll be going around. All the scriptures will be on the screen or also in your notes, but these will be our theme verses, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to prevent, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I would say those are some rich verses right there. <clears throat> Paul is appealing to us, he says. In other words, he's making an urgent request. This is a big deal. He says, by the mercies of God, some versions say, in view of God's mercy, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I think some versions say, which is your reasonable service. And so we could say that is reasonable. If you look at that whole verse in context, it is reasonable in view of God's mercy, or because of what God has done for us, it is reasonable that we give ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. Give him our all, no matter what, because of what he has done for us. And that's a big deal. And it is also, I would say, by far the, the best deal. It is the best deal we could ever imagine because God has so much for us. And so I'm excited to share some reasons why 
with you this morning as we talk about embracing adventure, because the Christian life is a life of adventure. And like seven of you like adventure. <laughs> so hopefully maybe 17 of you by the end will like adventure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to start off this morning, God, by thanking you. <coughs> by thanking you, Lord, for, for who you are. Lord, for your presence in our lives, your presence in this world. Just by acknowledging, Lord, your holiness, your mercy, as that scripture points out. We just thank you so much for what you have done in our lives, Lord. I pray that as we go about this sermon and as we talk about adventure, as we talk about uncomfortable things that often happen in our lives, Lord, I just pray that you would speak to each and every one of us, that this would be relevant to each of the things that are going on in our different lives as we go about this day, as we go about our week, and just different things we have coming down the pipe, Lord. We know that part of adventure is there are things that happen that we don't expect, things that we don't plan for, Lord. There are things that are difficult. But as I've said already, Lord, giving our lives to you is the best deal we could ever make, Lord. Because you have provided for us, you love us, you care for us. You promise, Lord, to be with us every step of the way. And so we lift up our time with each other and with you here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So it was October of 2022. I was with a group of eight guys, eight guys total, including myself. Guys that many of you know, I was with Dennis Rose. I was with Dennis Rogers, Chris Cram, Joel Gasaway, Dominic Marquez, Michael McGuire, and Isaiah Aguayo. And we went through a process several months back, and we all got permits to hike to the top of Mount Whitney, 14,500 feet in elevation, outside of the state of Alaska, the highest point in the United States. And when you get a permit to hike Mount Whitney, the the date you get is the date you go. You cannot change it no matter what the weather does that day that you're supposed to be there, or if you just aren't feeling it, or if you just want to switch into a different day. I also read that the summit success rate for Mount Whitney is right around 50%, so about half the people make it to the top. And I said there were eight of us. Dennis Rose was actually speaking with his son a few days before our trip, and he said there's eight of us going on this trip, and he said, well, it's a guaranteed dad somebody's going to fail. That was his son's encouragement. <laughs> Thanks, Timmy. Statistically, four of us should fail on this hike, right? And as we arrived at camp at the Whitney Portal a couple days before our hike, we were consistently watching the weather forecast. The first snowstorm of the season was on its way. In fact, it was scheduled to hit at about 11 a.m. on the day of our hike. And so with all the weather issues aside, originally our plan was to leave for our hike around 4 o'clock in the morning. That would have put us hiking in the dark for about three hours, but would have given us plenty of time to make it up and back in one long day. But with the weather coming, we didn't want to be approaching the summit in a storm. We wanted to have at least made it to the top and been on our way back down before the storm hit. And so we would discuss this off and on throughout the days leading up to the hike. When, when should we leave? How, how early is too early? How late is too late? And we were all sitting around the campfire, and Dennis Rose just speaks up, and he said, we need to leave at 10. And I'm like, 10? What do you mean 10? And he meant 10 p.m. the night before. Because you need in that area, you need a permit for what's called the Whitney Zone. Okay, that's where the permit is required. And that zone doesn't start until about three and a half miles up the trail. And our permit was for a day hike only, which meant it was good for one 24-hour period from midnight to, I guess you could say, 11.59 p.m. And so Dennis pitched that if we left the campground at 10 p.m., drove up to the trailhead, we'd be on the trail between 10.15, 10.30. We could hike through the night, but that would put us at that Whitney zone right around midnight on the day that our permit was valid, which would maximize our time in terms of legally being on the trail. And it seemed crazy. It also seemed like our only option, right? To hike um, in the dark for over eight hours through the night, it's not ideal, but it's not ideal to get stuck in a snowstorm. 
either. And so we all kind of paused and thought about it for a little bit. And Joel spoke up and he said, that sounds terrible. I'm in. <laughs> and over the next couple hours, we talked through it. And everyone agreed that that's what we were going to do. And it was hard because we were operating on very little to no sleep at all. I think I went to bed around 7 o'clock that night in my tent, but I, I didn't fall asleep. Other guys just sat around the fire and talked, which is one of the reasons I didn't fall asleep. Um, but just sat around, talked until it was time to leave. I think all in all, we, had, we were up from start to finish for about 34, 35 hours. The trail to the summit is about 11 miles, starting at 8,400 feet, climbing all the way up to 14,500, and then you turn around and you take the same 11 miles back down, about 22 miles round trip. A lot of pain, a lot of struggle, something I've never experienced before, um, altitude sickness. I was really surprised. This was my second time on Mount Whitney, but I, I found myself getting sick as we got closer, and. You're supposed to turn around when that happens. <laughs> Everybody, please, don't listen to me. Turn around when that happens. But by about 7 a.m. that morning, all eight of us reached the summit. The forecast said it was supposed to be about 18 degrees up there that morning. It was windy. I think it was a little bit colder. We all huddled together. We were sweaty from our hikes, so to get up at the top and be in the wind and stuff like that, we all huddled together in this little summit hut at the top of the mountain. We took a picture, and then we just kind of headed back down. Our eyes were kind of glazed over. We were just kind of like out of it, at least I was. And as we're heading on the way down, as we reached about 12,000 feet on the way down, the summit began to be just completely covered in clouds, and the snow started falling. And several people were climbing up what's called the 99 switchbacks. Sounds fun, right? <laughs> we're getting ready to go down the 99 switchbacks. Several people are coming up. And they're looking for the summit, which they can't see now because it's covered and it's starting to snow. Those were the people who left at 4 a.m., like we originally planned on doing. And they were looking ahead and seeing the weather coming in fast. They were uncertain they'd be able to make it the remaining few miles. And that night we met people who did not make it to the top that day because of the weather. But I think of the attitude of that crew of guys that I was with on that trip. I think of Joel saying, that sounds terrible. I'm in! <laughs> And a quote like that is right up my alley. I'm a person who embraces adventure. I take part in events that uh, you could say manufacture suffering. Sounds fun, right? I pay money to do hard things sometimes. I don't get it. I know everyone is not wired in that way. Not everyone is messed up in the head as some of us. But I believe that there's a special unique bond that can be formed in a group of people who go through shared suffering, shared difficulties, hard times together. How many times have you ever, for example, had, had a trip, Greg mentioned it when he was up here a little bit, had a trip that just didn't go as planned, just seemed like a total disaster. How did it end up this way? I had a trip like that as a kid, our car broke down, just all kinds of difficult, difficult things, and like, my family to this day looks at that as one of the greatest trips we ever had as a family. And almost nothing went right. <laughs> and so these things are a part of life. These things are certainly a part of the Christian life. When you become a follower of Jesus, your life doesn't suddenly turn perfect with no issues, no trials, no hardship. In fact, there's indication in Scripture that when you become a follower of Jesus, some things are actually going to get more difficult for you. And so this morning, the challenge for us will be to embrace adventure. It's not simply um, about manufacturing some suffering in your life. The encouragement isn't going to be to go out and sign up for a marathon, though, go for it. But it will be an encouragement to recognize that there's going to be certain things in life that come our way. And they're things that are not a surprise to God. And he has a plan. He knows what's going on, and he is there to help you walk through these things. And not only that, I believe how we respond to difficult things in our life will play a huge part in our sanctification. Sanctification, that process of becoming more and more like Jesus. We are formed through our experiences, I think. We are often shaped through suffering. We can grow through trials and difficulties. And that difficult time on Mount Whitney was a growth opportunity that I believe 
mirrored my own spiritual life and experiences. And so in your notes today, we have three simple points that really get to what it means for a Christian to embrace adventure. I would say number one is embrace the unexpected. You've probably heard phrases like this before. Sometimes life just throws you curveballs. Absolutely. In life, we regularly have to tackle the unexpected. And it can be something so simple that can make us so mad, like they got your order wrong at a restaurant. Doesn't that just take you off? That's unexpected. It can also be something so complex as the death of a loved one. Maybe an unexpected death or some sort of drastic life change that you had no idea was going to take place. Some sort of illness that just seems to completely change the course of your life. But we need to realize, in fact, I would say I, I appeal to you, as Paul said in our scripture in Romans, I'm about to make an urgent, serious request that we all come to the realization that no matter how many times we are surprised by things in our lives, no matter how many times we're caught off guard, no matter how many times the unexpected arises, God is not surprised. He knows all. He's never up there throwing his arms up in despair. <laughs> what am I going to do now? Sometimes kids get thrown for a loop by the unexpected, and they say a phrase like this. This is the worst day ever! <laughs> Maybe adults say that sometimes, but how many worst days ever have our kids really had? <laughs> how many worst days ever have we really had? We don't like it when plans don't go our way. We make plans thinking everything's going to go according to plan, but life constantly gets in the way. Proverbs 19, verse 21 <clears throat> It says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Yeah. You see, we can plan and think whatever we want about how things are going to work out, but we're not in control. God is in control, has an ultimate plan and an ultimate purpose, and nothing can, can throw him off track or keep him from accomplishing what he's out to accomplish. Romans 8, 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That should give us great hope. That shouldn't leave us in any sort of despair, no matter what's going on in our lives. The God who loves us, who knows us, he is working things together for good. Circumstances are out of our control, and things are going to happen. The unexpected will always arise. But isn't it incredible to know that the God of the universe will be with you every step of the way? And if you have that real relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and there, there are no promises your life's going to be made perfect, but again, there's a promise that he will be with you every step of the way. And so it's actually reasonable, we talked about reasonability in our scripture today, it's actually reasonable to embrace the unexpected because we know that God has a plan. And we know that he will work us through these things as we're continually being sanctified, growing closer to him every day, every step of the way. And sometimes the unexpected comes and things just seem to get worse. You can't just simply make this minor course correction to get things right. The unexpected arises and you end up maybe even having to go a whole different, maybe longer road and maybe it gets really, really hard. Number two, something we all love embracing, Embrace suffering. Can I get an amen? There was one. Seven people are adventurous. One person wants to embrace suffering. I believe that in this day and age, we are way too comfortable. Way too comfortable. I heard the word soft over here. We try to avoid difficult situations as much as possible. And then when we get into a difficult situation, our goal is to get out of it as soon as possible, no matter what. In general, we don't push ourselves. We don't seek to develop character by doing hard things. Everything is pretty much handed to us. We get what we want when we want it. But one of the key things that Scripture mentions, really promises, is that in the life of a Christian, suffering will be present. Jesus even spoke in a way to communicate that we should expect it. We should expect people to be against us. He said we should even expect persecution. In Acts chapter 14, the apostles are going from town to town preaching about Jesus. And in verse 22, they tell the people this. We must go through many tribulations in order to enter the kingdom of God. And I think the bottom line of what's being communicated there is it's difficult. 
to be a Christian. The world doesn't like us that much. The world is about other things, and as our scripture said, we as Christians are supposed to be counter-cultural. Do not conform to the ways and patterns of this world. We are supposed to be different. We're supposed to live different. We are actually called aliens in scripture. We're told this is not our home. Romans 8, we've already mentioned it once, but it's a chapter that talks a lot about suffering. Gives us a picture that, yes, though we suffer, though we have hard times in this world, God has already overcome, and there are much greater things in store for us. Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you understand what he's saying right there? Whatever you go through in this life in terms of hardships, difficulties, struggles, trials, they're not worth even trying to compare them to the future glory that we will have in eternity with Christ. Yes, life stinks sometimes. But at the level at which life stinks sometimes, it's not even comparable to how it will be when we are with Jesus forever and eternity. Future glory, that verse says. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But for now, I'd like to do something a little different than what we would normally do on a Sunday sermon. I would like to ask that everybody close their eyes. I'm not going to throw anything at you. I'm not going to throw the water on you. I'm just going to take a sip of the water. Close your eyes and keep them closed, please, until I tell you to open them. I want each of us to have the chance to acknowledge some things today. So let's acknowledge with every... Every eye closed, raise your hand if you are in agreement with me that life is difficult. Don't be shy. Pretty sure everybody's got their hand up. I'm not going to name names. Keep that hand up. Keep your hand up if you would admit that you have suffered in a situation recently. Yeah. Keep it up or... Put it back up. If you've been in a situation dealing with something in your life lately that has been unexpected, you had a plan, and now it seems like that plan has just been derailed. Maybe it's a, a major loss. Maybe it's a major responsibility that you have suddenly had to take on. Maybe it's a separation in your life that is coming up or something like that. Yeah. How about this one? Keep your hand up, or put your hand up, if you have had trouble in a personal relationship with someone lately. It could be a friend. It could be a family member. It could be someone in authority over you, a boss, a co-worker, a parent, a child, a brother, sister, a neighbor. And let's admit this right now, too. Your hands might be getting tired. But keep your hand up if you would admit that in those situations, in those relational issues, you've probably done some things you shouldn't have. Some things that didn't help. You've probably contributed negatively to the situation. It may not be entirely your fault. Maybe you didn't start the conflict, but maybe you did something intending to finish it. Maybe you blurted out something in anger. Maybe you said something and it hurt someone else, or maybe someone did that to you. Last one. Keep your hand up, or put your hand back up, if you would admit that there's something going on in your life right now that you are fearful of. Maybe you have something coming up, and you're just, you're just terrified. You don't know how to handle it. You'd rather just not do anything, but you know that that is not the right way. Now, we could go on and on about all these things, give countless other examples. You can put your hands down. You can open your eyes. This is all part of living in a fallen world. A world where, though, God is in control, right? Humans are continually hurting each other, getting sick, experiencing pain, loss, separation, so many other issues. We are suffering. But we can have great hope in Jesus because we know that, that Jesus suffered way more on this earth than we ever will. 
He died on the cross for our sins. He took our place. He paid the penalty for us in coming down to earth, living the perfect life that we could never, ever live, and then dying on the cross, taking our sin upon himself as the perfect sacrifice. And so when we talk about future glory, while he rose from the dead, he didn't stay dead. He proved that he is who he said he is by conquering death itself, by raising from the grave. And though we are living in this world with all the hardships, all the difficulties, all the suffering, God promises that he will be with us. He wants us to grow in him through these situations. He promises not only will he be with us, but in the future, all this suffering is going to go away. And he will make everything right. So let's focus on that. Let's hope in that. Let's turn to him in our time of need because he's calling us and because he wants to comfort us. He wants all of us to give all of our hope, all of our trust, all of our life to him. Again, as that scripture said, as living sacrifices. So embrace the unexpected. Embrace suffering. And here we go. Deep breath. Embrace glory. Embrace glory. When I finished that Mount Whitney hike, whew, there was a lot of glory. It felt so good to be done. I was exhausted. I ended up finishing around 3 p.m., which means it was about a 17-hour hike. And the feeling when we were done caused me to look back fondly on all that pain and suffering. Not everybody felt that way. There are people on that trip who said, I'm never doing anything like this again. <laughs> but I embraced the glory by heading over to the restaurant at Whitney Portal and having a bacon cheeseburger and fries soda. That was a, a glorious meal. And then I had uh, the best night's sleep that I've ever had in a tent in my life. I slept 13 hours that night, and it was absolutely amazing. And as followers of Jesus, we, we experience glory in different ways. There are times when we experience glory on this earth, when maybe we've gone through a situation, and we realize, looking back, man, this is this has turned out better than I could have ever imagined. Nothing went as planned. Nothing went how I thought it was going to be. But wow, I'm glad we went through this. And of course, there is that future glory that we read about in Romans chapter 8. Eternal glory. And so in life, when we're faced with unexpected, when we're faced with suffering, let's all continue to remember and to remind each other that God is in control. He's not surprised. Let's let the glory always be his. Let us tackle our challenges with hope because of the future glory that God promises. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. And you've got to think in context. When you read verses in the New Testament that talk about suffering, what was the suffering like that they were going through compared to the suffering that we're going through? Think about that when you read this from 1 Peter. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's incredible. Nicole and I have a, a couple that we have known since we were pretty young. Nicole grew up in church with the wife. We also went to high school with the husband. I played sports with him. My brother was friends with his brother. And in 2010, the husband was diagnosed with cancer. And they set up a site with email updates and things like that that went out regularly. People were invited to pray for him, and they would both regularly write updates on the site. And the site proved to not just be this simple place to, to keep track of how he was doing. It ended up being a place where the gospel was shared, where different stories and Prayer requests were submitted for different people that they came into contact with while he was on this cancer journey. And I think of the two of them as I think of the main points in our sermon today because they certainly embraced the unexpected. They didn't know this was going to happen in their life. They didn't know the road that was before them. We have all kinds of expectations as to how our life will end up. But the unexpected comes, and God wants to use it for his glory. And that's exactly what they did, is they had to undergo a major pivot in the direction of their life. I would certainly say they embraced suffering. Sometimes the updates were 
Um, one of them writing in just really open and honest ways about how they were feeling about the things that they were going through. How is this affecting their kids as they grow up with their dad being in this condition? How long is dad even going to be around? But they always drew back to the promises of God. With every update, they would close out with a scripture in just these incredible, powerful ways. They were such a great example as to how Christians should respond in times like this. And just a week ago, yesterday, an update went out with a subject line that read, The end is drawing near. A 13 and a half year cancer battle. And you know what they did in that update? They invited people over to their house to say goodbye. They said, open doors, just come on by. And for the next week, spontaneous prayer and worship sessions happened in their house. Just an incredible outpouring of love and support of God's people. And on Thursday morning, this past Thursday, I woke to this update with the subject line from Wednesday at 11 p.m. David has gone to be with the Lord in glory. And before even reading the update, just out loud, I just said, praise God. And I can't even come close to imagining what sort of state I would be in if I lost my wife to something like this. But even the update about his death was filled with rejoicing, filled with glory, thanking the Lord that he's no longer in pain and that he is in the presence of the Lord. Really, he's got the better end of the deal. Because we're all still here, right? And that puts things into perspective for me. The things in my life that tick me off, the things that can ruin my day, the things that don't go as planned, the worst day ever! And it's usually because of the one-lane traffic. <laughs> that was a convicted laugh right there, right? <laughs> So I want to close with a scripture from 2 Corinthians that was posted in one of their updates from a while back. And I believe it is a perfect verse to put our suffering into perspective, no matter what that may be. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, what a, what a message you have brought to us this morning. What an amazing section of scripture of your word, Lord, that can encourage us, that can challenge us, Lord, that can comfort us and even help to put things into perspective for us. Help us, Lord, to, as much as we possibly can, look at, look at the big picture. Whatever difficulties we face, let us consider what your word says. What your word calls them, light, momentary afflictions, temporary troubles, things that are transient, things that will pass away. But Lord, we also want to acknowledge that even these momentary afflictions can be very difficult, especially in the midst of them, especially when maybe surrounded by fear or uncertainty or even seeming chaos, Lord. So let this not be a message where people are perceiving, I'm just telling you to push these things aside or suck it up and deal with it. Let us never be ashamed, Lord, to bring our concerns to you in open and honest ways. Let us share these things even with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us, as your people, come alongside one another and bear one another's burdens. But Lord, give us an eternal perspective, always an eternal perspective. Lord, this too shall pass. You are our strength, our rock, our source, our everything. And we praise you, Lord, so much for who you are. 
And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Almighty Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this church. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word that is preached here. Lord, we, we thank you that you are in our lives every day. Father God, you are amazing. And we thank you that we can embrace the adventure. We can enjoy the adventure. When we put ourselves on your side, we follow your lead. We take things on head on the way you would have us do it. Thank you, Lord. We ask that you accept these tithes and offerings, accept us and use us. We belong to you. What your son has done, the sacrifices made, Father God, thank you. Help us go out this week. Put these words on our heart. Meditate on them. Think about them. Because every day is an adventure. We live in San Diego, the adventure capital of the world. You can do anything here. Father God, I thank you for answered prayer. I thank you that you show up. God, you are amazing, and we love you. Pray all these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.